One of the reasons I get passionate about photography is that I'm a big advocate for um, encouraging good mental health. And I know a lot of people do struggle with mental health. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that has still got a certain stigma to it. So if you've got a broken leg or arthritis or whatever it is, something obvious like that, that's one thing. But if you just struggle sometimes to get out of bed in the morning, and that might be every day, um, it's not the sort of thing that often people feel comfortable talking about or that maybe people want to hear about. So it's it's really difficult to know. So from that perspective, this is one of the reasons that I, I love photography, because I think one of the best things you can do to have good mental health is to find something that you feel passionate about, that you get excited, you get excited about when you think about doing it, you look forward to doing it. And photography is one of those things that can plug that gap for many people. It's a creative outlet. It's one of those passions, if you like, that you can always be learning. I I think as a photographer, um, certainly my experience, and I've been doing photography for um, um, 50 years now, and um, I'm always learning. And I find that it's, it's not only that new things come along. So I started with film, and then I experimented with different types of film. I tried different cameras, so got onto 35mm, Uh, tried small format cameras, tried medium format, um, all of that stuff. But also then you move on to digital and what can digital offer you that film didn't, what can film offer that digital doesn't. So it's learning those aspects. And then, of course, there's the whole variety that's in front of you with how do you create a photograph, how do you create a picture. And that's partly what I want to talk about in this podcast. And I've made it about wildlife because this series of podcasts is really about um, travel, wildlife, adventures, that sort of stuff. So um, this, I think, goes to the heart of what this podcast is about. So if you go away, if you go somewhere exotic, if you're lucky enough to go, it can be pretty obvious. If there are animals, there are elephants, tigers, whales, whatever it might be, it's obvious that you want to get a, a photo of them and often you have to move pretty fast to get it. And I've spoken in other podcasts about the kind of mistakes people make, about the best kind of gear that you can take with you, even what to do when you're practicing for that big trip, because the worst thing is to book one of these amazing trips, trips, be looking forward to it for months, and then you get there and your camera doesn't work, or you get your thumb in front of everything, or it's just an absolute disaster from the photography standpoint and part of that is that I think with photography it's a fantastic way of sharing the experience with other people who can't be there with you and also reliving it for yourself and anybody else that you're with when you do that because looking back at photographs particularly if you shoot a lot and then you look at them a few months later because you're going to be you're going to be looking at those photographs with a new pair of eyes when you look at photographs when you've just shot them you're sort of looking to the filter of the picture you were trying to get rather than the picture you've actually ended up with. And those two might be different and you might be disappointed with that result. And this is certainly my experience that I've gone back and looked at photographs that I glanced at when I took them, really didn't like them. But when I've looked at them months later without that that filter on, I really like them because I see them for what they are. And um, I might experiment with them in post-processing. So there again is another layer these days with digital photography that we can do things in post-processing. And so we can change the composition. We can change the feeling, the emotional connection with that photograph. We can change the mood of it. So there are various ways of, of doing that in post-processing. So to me, photography is one of those pastimes, one of those passions where you're always growing, it always challenges you. If if you look at other people's work, first of all, you can look at it and think, well, how did they do that? And as you get better, as you get more experience, you begin to work out what they were doing just by looking at the photograph. You can look at the lighting, you can look at where the light's coming from, uh, you can look at what's in focus, what isn't, all those kind of things, and begin to put together in your mind how they achieve that result. And then you can go off and, first of all, maybe duplicate that result so that you're now shooting the same style of photograph and then you can put your own spin on it you can put your signature on it you can make it your own by just tweaking something and then you get a different look that's that's all yours 
So I wanted to talk about subjects and given that I'm a wildlife photographer, I like to photograph large mammals. That's primarily what I do. Uh, however, I'll photograph pretty much anything. <laughs> so uh, particularly when I'm trying something out, I like to try different perspectives, getting in close. So there, there are different things to think about. And this is why having a subject that kind of does its own thing is a bit more of a challenge than, say, photographing your dog if you have one. Although in, in many cases, the dog might be doing its own thing as well. Or photographing a person, because with a person you can pose them. I mean, that that also has its own challenges. And there's a whole skill set in doing good photographs, not only in positioning the person, but establishing rapport, because the level of trust they have in you does come through in the photographs. So there's a whole other skill set there. And um, in fact, portrait photography is one of the aspects of photography that I take out as a separate subject in the courses that I offer. And it's based very much on the webinars I was doing a uh, year and year, the last one to two years ago, uh, when I was focusing more on the how to part of photography. So let's get back to wildlife. Now, obviously, I don't know where you live, I don't know your situation. It may be you live in um, a lodge on, on the Serengeti, <laughs> there's a waterhole just in front of you, and you put the lights on every night and you just watch what comes down to the waterhole. But the chances are that isn't where you live. So, what can you do? If you've got a modest garden in a, a townhouse in a, a you know modest garden, which might well be the case, or you might live in an apartment or a flat or a unit, depending on where you are. So your options there are likely to be a bit more limited. Um, certainly when I was living in Sydney, I didn't get to see much wildlife unless you counted huntsmen's, which I was never that thrilled about seeing anyway. But and to be honest, I don't think I ever took a picture of one either. So you might have something immediately to hand, or it may be if you can get out for five, ten minutes and go somewhere, you might well have a little bit of land, a park, um, a, a bit of uh, maybe a national park if you're really lucky, but just some land where you can watch animals do their own thing. Now, I'm lucky. I live in, um, uh, I've got a house with a fair sized garden in uh, southwest France. I'm on the edge of a small village, so it's sort of semi-rural here and um, I sometimes see deer either at the end of my garden or in the field next to it. Uh, I saw a hare this morning which I hadn't seen before but when I was cutting the grass that first cut of the year when it's quite long I could see the runs that had been made by a little animal and I didn't know what it was until I saw the hare this morning and um, obviously there are lots of birds as well and things like squirrels and all these sort of animals so the first thing to do is think about what you do have access to. And this is animals. And of course, the other thing most of us have access to, not always willingly, but they're there, are of course insects. And insects can also be pretty amazing if you take the time to begin to study them and take photographs of them. Now, um, obviously, the equipment that you have will dictate what you can do. And to shoot insects, you really want to have a good macro lens, try and get close up to them but again if you've got a decent telephoto that might also work you just step a bit further back and um, that might work as an alternative for you and then the thing to do is once you've found these animals and I must say birds are great if you listen to me talk about practicing on animals birds are, are a good one because they can be very tricky they're often moving about they often aren't particularly uh, keen on being photographed so you've got to be quick and it does actually allow you to develop those skills where you can get a, shoot, a good shot quickly. So you might have certain photography equipment. I'm assuming that you've got something because you're listening to this. It might be your smartphone and um, that's fine. You can shoot good photographs on a smartphone, although your options might be a little bit limited. If you've got camera gear, then obviously the gear you have will dictate the options you have um, to shoot. But if we kind of move on from that, so let's assume that you've got wildlife of some description that you can you can shoot. You've got equipment to do the photography with, and um, hopefully it's adequate for shooting those kind of animals. If not, and I'm just thinking of things like lighting. If you're indoors, you might have to be a bit creative in how you come up with lighting solutions. And I certainly know photographers who've 
come up with some very interesting solutions just using what they have around the house. So that's something to think about if you don't have a flash gun or anything like that. And you're, you're, I don't recommend flash with really animals of any sort, but in some situations, you, if you're photographing insects, that might be um, uh, an option for you. But really, you want to experiment with using a higher ISO number. So make your sensor very sensitive. If you're on a digital camera, if you are using film, just try a high ISO film. Just see how high you can go and just experiment with different film stock. And I used to do that a lot. And I would find that certain stock I liked because it was good for certain subjects. For example, whales, I was photographing a lot. And there was a Fuji Chrome I used to always buy because I liked the way it handled the blues. That's the blues in the picture, not the music. Um, other film I loved were things like um, uh, the uh, Kodak films. They did Portra, I think, was the one which was quite vivid with the colours. So it was just, I really liked it for portraits. Um, and um, anything where you had a lot of colour. Um, alternative, I'm just talking about film. If you want to really experiment, you could try uh, cross-processing. So that's um, shooting uh, negative film, but processing it as if it was a slide film and doing the, the reverse. These are great things to play around with. And this is where you know, I'm talking about how you can constantly be learning with photography. This is one of the ways you can do that. Now, it might sound a little old fashioned and out of date, but the fact is that film is making something of a comeback and um, people are buying film cameras. So if that's you, then start thinking about what you can do beyond the film itself. But film has its own characteristics, the grain and all these sorts of things too. If you're using digital, fantastic, because you automatically and very easily have a whole raft of things you can experiment with with the post-processing software. Some of it's free. If you're on a, using a smartphone, there are free packages around you can download or you can invest a little bit of money in a package and you don't have to overcommit. But they all have um, their own features. They, they all offer you creative things you can do with the photograph once you've taken it. So the, create, the creativity part of it goes beyond simply uh, taking the shot. So what I do want to talk about, though, is when you're photographing an animal, what are the sort of things to think about? Well, what makes a great wildlife photograph? Now, I'm not going to tell you because that's quite subjective, because what I think is a great wildlife photograph, you might think is awful. So you need to start getting personal about it and think about wildlife photographs that you've really liked and then begin to deconstruct them in your mind. You know, what, what is it? what is it about a specific or a specific group of, group of photographs that you really like? Is it the way the lighting has been handled? Is it the movement? Is it the depth of field? Um, is it the lighting? You know, is it a moody shot? How has it been framed? Is there a lot of space? Can you see context in the shot? Because one option you've got when you're photographing wildlife is to come out and do a, wild, a wide shot and show context. And then where do you put the subject? You stick it in the middle? Well, that's kind of boring. Do you use the rule of thirds? Do you use um, um, the? Um, uh, do you use another rule? So there are plenty of rules about you can be using. Do you stick it in one of the corners and create a lot of space around that animal? How are you using space in the photograph? Are you creating space for the animal to move into visually, or are you putting the space behind the animal, or above it, or below it? So think about these sort of things about how you're positioning and how you're composing. The photograph and the step back from that and this is another thing that I've <clears throat> excuse me uh, released um, a podcast about at least one is being a visual storyteller so I like that approach to photography because in that way you're thinking more about what the end result is going to be what are you trying to communicate to the person who looks at your photograph they might know you they might not but what is it you want to say to them about what you're shooting. Why? What? What is prompting you to photograph this animal? Is it to share just seeing the animal? Is it to share something about the animal's lifestyle or what it does? Is it about its location? It might be in an unusual location. If you're in a, a town, uh, you might get things like foxes. And I think in England, foxes are coming into towns more often now, um, if I if I recall that correctly. So. Something like that, it can be, a, you know, and again, in my head, I've got a fox just going through rubbish or rubbish bins. It's about, um, and this is at night. So 
the story to me would be what happens in your location that you know really well during the day who takes over at night because there's another population at night and you're not a part of it because you're asleep and so is pretty much everyone else you know so that can be a great subject for a story just to do some urban shots at night just go out at night sometimes you don't need the animals it's just the way the shapes that the light form that they form a, a leading line that you can kind of follow down a street what it what is the story there are many other things you can do now i'm looking at wildlife but obviously with urban photography or if you're out in the country you can do that kind of thing you can just um, start to let your imagination roam free a little free a little bit and think about the kind of photographs you can take. Um, great ones are if you have access. A friend of mine have a little remote camera in um, a bird box. So I think there are blue tits in there. Uh, so they can see what's going on with these birds as they as they hatch and they grow older. So maybe that would be a great subject to just do a, a photograph every day, every couple of days, or whatever it might be for whatever you're photographing because I'm sure you can take stills off that and then put those together um, in, a, in an album or a photo book even. So hopefully you're starting to get ideas as I'm talking through these about the kinds of things that are accessible to you where you live and what you might be able to do. I mean, another one might be to set up a camera and take a photograph at the same time time of day every day or once a week it could be every Monday at 9 p.m and if you do that over a year you've got 52 photographs there but you can show the change in the seasons what else is going on are there different animals at different times of year that you're seeing that you can see from wherever you're taking these photographs um, what, what's what's going on so again, it's about telling a story and one photograph can tell a story or you might do it over a whole series of photographs. So that I think is an important question. What is it you want to share? And assume that other people are going to see the photograph. So before you take it, what is it you want to communicate about your subject to the person who's seeing it? And this is where things like wildlife photography and conservation photography get very powerful because the people taking those photographs, that's the kind of mindset they have. That's the way they're thinking when they take the shot. They're not just taking a shot of a bit of rubbish on a beach, but they can put it in context. They can show the whole beach. Hopefully there's only one piece, but there might be a whole stream of pieces that are being washed up. And this is every morning. You know, they might do a beach cleanup, photograph it the following day, and it's almost as bad or within a week. But there are some places where it does get that bad and it's quite scary. But Without those people taking photographs and sharing them, even if it's just on social media, we lose that awareness. So it makes other people aware and other people might want to try and do something about it. They want, might, might want to connect with you to help use your photographs to help them make a change so that uh, steps are taken to prevent that happening. So there's a lot of places these photographs can go. And that's why I think it's important, not only for your own creativity and perhaps to challenge you a little bit, but to just think about the photograph before you take it. Another thing might be to get a real connection with the animal. Now, one of the things I like to try and do, well, with any of the mammals I shoot, it's much harder with uh, things like whales because you don't get the opportunity very often. But certainly with land animals, things like elephants, tigers, lions, those sorts of animals, cheetahs, um, any land animal that I've shot, gorillas are amazing to be close to them. I'm trying to get in close and shoot basically a portrait. So the key thing for me is to have very good eye contact and to have the eye in sharp focus. What happens with the rest of the face and the head, to some extent, doesn't really matter. I might experiment with it a little bit with my depth of field. So I might have a shot of the uh, the animal with the whole head in sharp focus and I might do another one where just the area in front of the eye and sort of behind the eye um, in terms of distance from the uh, um, the camera, that they're in focus and the rest of it is out of focus so that you're really drawn into the eye. So that, again, is an important aspect of composition. Where do you want the viewer's eye to travel when they are looking at the photograph? So some of the things you can do here are to tilt the angle slightly 
um, particularly if you're photographing anything that has straight lines. So tilt the angle so that um, everything isn't square with the, the, the frame of the shot. Another thing is to have leading lines in there. Is there something you can use or a series of things that will naturally draw the viewer's eye through the photograph and round to your subject? Um, and hopefully at the same time telling some sort of a story, uh, creating some context. So you take the viewer on a little journey through the photograph. So that's that again is a great way to compose a photograph. So with these ideas, if you're looking at photographs that you really like, whether it's wildlife or something else, start thinking along those lines. Are they using leading lines? Um, what sort of depth of field have they got? How have they positioned the thing they want me to photograph? Is it in the middle? Is it off to the side? Is it up in a corner somewhere? And if it's up in a corner, what else is in the shot? You know, why is it up in that corner? What's the significance of placing it there? And how do I feel about it? Because the, the, the really great photographs are the photographs we love. And of course, love is an emotion. So these are the photographs where we have a, a strong um, emotional response to it. You could also argue that powerful photographs, and when you use that word, can be subjects that are very disturbing. And here I'm thinking about some of the photographs that are taken during armed conflicts. Um, you, you may well have a very emotional reaction to it, but it's not necessarily an emotion you want to have that often. But this is, again, one aspect of, of making really powerful photographs. It is establishing an emotional connection with your viewer. So don't underplay that. Be very um, aware of it. And even think about that when you're looking at the sort of photographs you really love. Do you love them? Because something about that shot has created an emotional response in you. And, and you really love it. Every time you look at it, you get that emotional response because that's, that is a really good photograph if it manages to achieve that. Now, coming back to subjects and coming back to um, the wildlife in your backyard, which is what I've called this one, um, a, a great thing to do as well is just to um, do a bit of study. So once you know what's around, Maybe just um, look them up. You know, Google's wonderful these days. You can look up anything you like on the, on the internet. So having realised that you have a particular animal or you know that you have a particular animal in your um, garden, do a bit of research on it. What are its habits? Are they mainly nocturnal? Do they tend to stay in the same place all year round or do they do they disappear? So there's a little robin redbreast that I've noticed in winter if I'm throwing out food for the birds he's always hanging around but he disappears towards the end of winter and I, I honestly don't know where he goes so um that's perhaps a bit of homework for me but any other animal or insect that you're you're photographing learn a bit more about them and then maybe you can illustrate a behavior or you can use something that you've learned in doing that research in the photograph that you've taken so definitely before I go away anywhere I'll do research on the animal so that I understand more about it. Uh, quite often, I mean, if I'm going somewhere where it's wild animals and it's a, an area I don't know, which is most of them, <laughs> uh, I'll make sure I've got a good guide. And <clears throat> so, you know, in that respect, I've got my walking research, but it's nice to do a bit of research yourself. So you've got some idea of um, the behaviors of the animal, what you're likely to see perhaps in terms of behavior, because it's very easy to get your expectations setting correctly we look at i mean some of these wildlife films particularly the bbc uh, wildlife films are absolutely amazing but to get those shots to get those few seconds of sequence um that they they get in the program might have taken months because it's just so hard to photograph and it's so rarely done so it's good to know what you're likely to get if behaviors vary during the year. Now, I'm going to use an anecdote, so don't rely on this, but my observation from my own experience with humpbacks was that they were more likely to breach and certainly come up to the boat in the second half of the season. So if you don't know, the humpback whales go north from um, Antarctica past Sydney up into Queensland waters in the uh, southern spring and summer. So when it gets colder down south, they head up north so they can mate and have calves. And then once that's all done, they head south again. So they get down south just as the southern summer is kicking in. So it's relatively warm down in Antarctica. So they're the two parts of the season. So first of all, if you're going to go and hunt 
the photograph humpback whales, you'd need to know that it's only six months of the year where you can see them anyway. And secondly, my observation was that they were more likely to swim up to the boat, do spy hops, things like that, during the second half of the migration when they were heading back down south. Um, you might get more breaches. I think breaches, to be honest, were probably reasonably evenly split either way. Um, sometimes you get them more when it was uh, a bit rough. I've seen that. But again, they'll also breach when it's a dead calm out there. So bear in mind with any anything that's based on observation, unless it's based on years of research and years of observation, there's going to be an element of, um, not doubt, but there's a, um, a you know, definitely a, a, it's not a guarantee that these things are going to happen. But do your research, first of all, particularly if it involves travel. But if you're looking at what's around you, what 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 happens at different times of year? So I've got little lizards that live um, next to the well in my back garden. I've got a well there. And they'll come out, obviously, in the summer. And there are small snakes as well. Uh, we have little whip snakes here. In fact, I saw one crossing the road uh, last week in my car. It's a very hot day. And um, this, this one must have been over a metre long, fairly sort of fat for one of those so that's the first time I've seen one of those just driving around it caught me unexpectedly but it's it's good to know more about what's around you and again it 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 can teach you more about your own area you might not be aware that certain animals do uh, live or are likely to live where you live but maybe they just come out at night you know how many owls are you likely to see or do you hear them or do you hear things making a racket at night it could sound like there's a fight going on or whatever else is it cats is it something else? So it's it's quite a nice form of research to do even before you start, just to maybe have a Google at the kind of wildlife that you're likely to find in the country and part of the country that you're in and the type of um, dwelling that you're in or type of um, you know immediate environment you're in, whether you're in a city centre or in a little village. All of these things can start pointing you towards certain animals. You may well learn that there are animals potentially about in your area that are quite interesting and you never even knew were there so coming back to where I started (laughs) which is talking about mental health and learning and growing and all of those things I think hopefully you can see that once you start getting into this it can be quite an interesting thing to do and you can start setting yourself challenges and in all of it you can feel hopefully a sense of achievement having learned something which is always a nice feeling you've learned something new about where you live you might be able to share it you might even find spots where different animals are likely to be so you can share those with people and share your photographs of them you might be able to get some pretty amazing photographs if you do all your homework and uh, perhaps willing to be um, a bit patient because uh, I think that's the big thing about wildlife photography it's um, if you're if you're patient <laughs> and you have the time to be patient, because sometimes if you're going somewhere for a week or so and you might only be in a particular area for a day or so, if nothing happens, um, that can be quite frustrating. Um, but if you are if you're doing it where you live, then presumably you can go back again and again, and um, eventually, hopefully, get get a nice shot. Or when you get shots of an animal, just look at them and what can you do to improve them can you make improve the level of connection with the animal can you tell the story differently Uh, what else can you do just look at what you've got and then try and build on each step so that as you as you go through the year as you as you spend more time doing this your, your photographs get more interesting because you're starting to think of other other aspects you can introduce to them okay so that is what I wanted to talk about in this podcast, again, I hope you find that useful. I hope it's got you thinking. Uh, if you're somebody who tends to keep the camera in a cupboard until you go away, <laughs> hopefully you're tempted to dust it off and uh, recharge the batteries and um, start looking around and taking some photographs. Uh, it's, it's a good thing as well if you can do it with other people. I think that's nice too. It's a nice thing to do if you're if you're one of those people who's quite happy doing things on their own. That's great. Uh, but if you like to be with other people, you might have um, a friend who um, who you can do that with. And I think as well, the more you sort of walk around and start photographing different things, the more it can prompt you to think a little bit more differently. And I'm thinking of, um, in fact, Colin Seaton, who did um, a photo talk for me under the Creative Photography Academy. But 
Colin used to, and still does run, I believe, the um, photo walks in Sydney that we observers run. And I have to say, Colin was one of the best people for spotting things. And he used to generally work with his smartphone. And on the walks, he was really good at just spotting potential subjects that you would walk by. I mean, benches, folding glass doors in a shop front, um, all sorts of things. And, and if you're shooting insects, I mean, you're down on the ground, but then you can do really interesting things with what's in the background. How about uh, a beetle walking along a pavement with, you know, the lights of a city centre in the background that are out of focus? I mean, that'd be pretty cool if, you're, if your camera's pretty much on the ground at the level of the animal. So... You know, what can you do? I've immediately done a portrait and a landscape <laughs> version of that. That's just in my head. But, you know, you can look around you, see what's there, and this is where you put context in. So that would be a great shot, not only visually, but also it's telling the story of what's in the city that people maybe don't even know is there. They just walk past them. They take no notice. And um, Shane as well, Shane Rosario at Weir Observes, was very good at spotting things uh, that everyone would walk past. Thousands of people will walk past every day and not even be aware, aware they were there. So I think starting with the wildlife is great. That might not float your boat and you might be thinking of a trip which is more urban or architecture or whatever it is. Well, if that's your thing, then go and do your thing You know, have a look around, maybe research the architecture, look at the history of the buildings in your area. When were they bought? Uh, when were they bought? <laughs> when were they built? Um, you might have some great Art Deco stuff if if your um, location was around during the, the 30s and 40s, uh, uh, last century's 30s and 40s, I should say, because we're starting to get close. Um, you know, what other stories are out there? What happens if you're in a tourist area? What's, what's it like out of season? You know, these are great photographs. If you're uh, maybe in Scotland or somewhere that really comes alive in the summer, but it's a small place that's completely different in the winter with snow and uh, maybe different animals about, different people. Obviously, trees look different. Um, so, yeah, have a think about projects you can do. Even if you're not going away somewhere, just think about whatever floats your boat. Just start going around, going around and taking photographs of places and start looking. And um, you might see details in the architecture that you hadn't noticed before. Um, I've, I've walked around central London. I tend to look, I mean, I'll look where I'm going, but I'll look up as well at the buildings because once you get above sort of first story height, sometimes there are really interesting things, scroll work or other things that, again, people just walk past and they don't even notice them and they might walk past that particular place every working day when they go to their office and then go back to the tube station or wherever they're doing. So, Get in the habit of looking around and start thinking about what's there. In the case of wildlife, uh, good eye connection, definitely. But think about how you're placing the animal in the frame. And if you get good at doing this at home, then when you, if you do go away, if you are traveling, you'll already have developed the habits where you won't even think about it when you're, you're away. You'll already be knocking off great photographs without even thinking twice about it. So... I do um, absolutely recommend it. And of course, from a mental health perspective, it gives you something that you can do for your own enjoyment, something that can you can continue to grow and develop. As far as I'm concerned, indefinitely, I don't think there's any limit really to how far you can take it. If you choose, it's something you can share with others or you could maybe find a group where you have common interests and make connections that way. So... There are definitely um, options and definitely things that you can do to help yourself in whichever way um, is most appropriate for you. So that's it. Thank you for your time. And I'll speak to you again in the next podcast. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. Uh, once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So... Uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. 
And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite and um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, and www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.